Extendable Engineers, this is Professor Gallagher, and we continue to work through the Dungeon Dice app. And our next lessons are all about refactoring and code organization. In this lesson, after first extracting a view, moving it to a separate file, and examining some basic issues to be aware of with preview providers, we'll begin work with extensions in SwiftUI in one of the simplest but most common ways they're used. That is to help us organize our code. We'll extract views and place them inside computed properties that are inside an extension, and this will set us up for more refactoring in our next lecture when we contrast techniques learned in this lesson with extracting views as subviews and point out more best practices. Time to extend that big learning. Giddy up! Now before we begin, I want to make one quick change. We actually don't need the entire geometry proxy passed into a range grid items, this geo value here. So I'm going to change this so that it only accepts the width. And remember from our earlier lessons that sizes related to graphics like width are expressed in CG float. That's the type. So we'll change the geo parameter here to just device width, lower camel case, and we'll set its type to CG float. And in the first line of the function, we'll replace geo.size.width with device width, that value we just passed in. And then we need to change both places where this function is called. So I'm going to backspace over the parameters and the call to arrange grid items above here. And I'm going to enter a paren. We see code completion now presents me with the correct option, which is device width as the value we're passing in. I'll press return here. And for the width, I'm going to enter geo.size.width. That is a CG float. Then I'm going to copy what's between these parentheses here, paste it over the parens in the other call to arrange grid items. We can test it out. It works fine. There's just no need to pass in the full geometry proxy named geo if all we need is the CG float of the width. Now, organizing code can be a controversial topic, and an argument can be made that this is a small, very basic app, and there's no harm in having everything in a single main content view file. But I do want to begin to show you some techniques that we can use to make our app code more readable. We're going to break out pieces of code that are all strung together in this one big struct, and there are a few reasons you want to do this. Writing more modular code can be easier to read. That makes it easier to maintain. And by putting data structures, variables, constants, functions, and separate files, we can isolate them just in the views where they're used so that they don't show up in places where they're never used. This reduces the risk that you'll erroneously refer to something you'll never need in another part of your code. And in some cases, you'll also want to move items in separate files so that they're available across multiple views and files. Files. We'll be doing this quite a bit in other apps. So let's start with some very basic steps. Now as we scroll through, we see there are four lines for the title text view, five lines for the result message text view. We've got about 20 lines to handle how the button is laid out in the lazy V grid and the H stack, but the button layout also uses a function down here and there are modifiers and a geometry reader associated with this. So this is actually more like 40 lines of code. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a single value to refer to each of these individual chunks of code. Those individual lines are gonna be listed here. So we'll have a text view, we'll have the result message text view, and we'll have a button layout grid view. We can jump to the code that the single lines will reference and you can make any changes you need in there. This is gonna be clear as we work through a few examples. Now first, let's go ahead and extract a view and we've done this before. So for this topmost view, the text view holding the static text dungeon dice, we learned in an earlier lesson, you can option click, then select extract subview from the quick functions menu. This extracts a view and gives it the generic name extracted view. So let's change that. We'll right click on extracted view, select refactor and rename. And a view is a type. So we always wanna use upper camel case. And why don't we call this title view? Press return, we've renamed the view, check out preview, everything continues to work fine, no change there. And if we scroll down to the bottom of the view, we can see our extracted view right at the end. Now oftentimes when you extract a view like this, you might use the same view in several different places. We're not gonna do that here, but if you are reusing the view, you oftentimes wanna put it in its own separate file. So why don't we show you how you do that? I'm gonna highlight the title view that we just extracted cut it out with a command X. Then in order to create a new file underneath the content view file, I'm gonna right click on content view and I'm gonna select a new file. Then select Swift UI file, click next. We're gonna name this title view, again, upper camel case, giving it the same name as the view we just extracted. Then press create. And now we see we've got our own outline of a Swift UI view. It was very similar to the content view when we first created an app, but it's got a hello world text view right here in the middle and its own preview provider. Now let's highlight this entire text view struct up top. We'll command V to paste over the struct that we just cut out of the content view. And look at this, in the preview view, we just see the preview for this view, not the entire app. 
it says dungeon dice in here. If we make a change to this, like in the string, if we add an exclamation mark at the end, we see that show up in the preview. And let's see what happens if we click back in the content view in the project navigator. But since this is the first file in our app, the live preview shows the entire app executing as if we were to start this app in our simulator. And up top, we've got our text view and it's got the exclamation point inside of it, even though this is read from another file. So to be clear what's going on here, when this code runs and it encounters this line that says title view with the parens after it, our executing code will find wherever the title view is defined. Now it's defined in a separate file, but that's totally okay. And it's gonna execute the code that's in this title view file, showing the text view just as we'd hoped. Cool. Now let's make changes to this file so that we can pay attention to some of the other behaviors when working with subviews in their own file. So first, I'm gonna comment out this font line and I'm gonna enter a custom font, a curvier font. Maybe you want something to look more regal for your Dungeon Dice app. So on the next line, I'm gonna enter dot font, but I'm gonna to refer to the custom font in here in one of the standard fonts on my Mac, not one of the system fonts. So I can do that with capital font, then dot custom, I'll select the option with the name and the size. Notice that you're gonna pass the font name in as a string, just as it shows up in your font menu. The font I'll refer to is called Snell Roundhand. That's capital S-N-E-L-L -L space, capital R, Roundhand. And for the size, I'll pass in 60. And this is huge and it touches both sides of the view. Now let's look at what it looks like in the content view different. Now it's on two lines here. And that's because if I code fold my V stack, we can see that there's padding down here, which is applied to everything inside of the V stack. So let's unfold this. We'll head back to the title view. Now I don't want to add padding inside of this struct because that's going to add padding here as well as the padding that's on my other file. But I can modify my preview provider down here to add some padding just for how it shows in the preview area of my canvas. Now the preview provider is I think one of the quirkier parts of working with Swift UI. I'm sure Apple is going to improve this over the years. The struct down here isn't run in the simulator. It doesn't have code that's in the final app. It's only here to set up how things show in the preview canvas at the right. So we see that there's one line in here that calls title view. That's evoking the title view struct that we have above this and that'll show the title view on the preview canvas. Now, if we enter a dot padding modifier below this call to title view, we won't add any padding to our code, but we will put padding around the preview view, and this is gonna mimic the padding that we have around the V stack and the content view without actually adding additional padding code to our text view struct. And now that I've done this, we can see that the text view is reformatted the same way that we saw it in the other file. Now, you might think we can fix this with a minimum scale factor modifier. I'll enter dot minimum scale factor below my text view and I'll pass in a 0.5 as the scale factor, but this doesn't stop the view from showing up on two separate lines. To limit the number of lines in our text view, we're gonna use a special modifier called a dot line limit. Code completion says that this sets the minimum number of lines that text can occupy in this view. Why don't we select this, enter a one, and now we see the minimum scale factor kicks in to ensure that all the text displays on a single line. And we can check back in the content view. We see that this also displays as expected on one line, fitting nicely into the padded area of the V stack. Cool. Now, since we're not using this title view, some devs would argue that putting this in a separate file is overkill. Now, there's nothing really wrong with this, but it does seem like a lot of extra work. Now, another thing we can do to make our code more modular that strikes a balance between breaking things out in separate files and leaving it all in one big struct is simply move the text view code from our title text view down to another part of the content view. We're going to use an extension for this. And instead of creating a separate view, we're actually going to create another variable that's going to be a computed property. This variable, the computed property, is gonna set up the text view with all of its modifiers so that anytime we refer to the variable, we'll see the text view set up perfectly. Let's see how to do this. First, since we don't need this title view file any longer, I'm gonna highlight that file, the title view file, over here in the project navigator, and then press the delete key. Xcode gives me some options. I'm gonna select move to trash. That's gonna completely throw away this file so that it doesn't linger around with the other files in my project. Then I'm gonna to return to the content view, and I'm gonna press command Z as many times as I need to. I think that's three times, so that I return the original text view right underneath the V stack. Just make sure you don't press Command Z too many times. You don't want to undo the changes we made that swapped out Geo for Device With. If you accidentally go back too far, you can just watch the first part of this video and redo those changes. 
Now we're going to put some of our individual view code inside of computed properties, variables that are inside of a part of our code called an extension. Now extensions in Swift can be super powerful. You can add functionality or extend the capabilities of other types that you create, structs or classes, or even types that are already part of Swift like strings or views. Now you can actually add methods or computed properties to extend these types. We'll create an extension here, but here we'll only use it as a place to more modularly organize and break out the functionality of our code. Code. So I'm going to create an extension down here at the bottom of my main content view struct. After this last curly that's flush left and just before the preview provider code struct starts, then we're going to enter the keyword extension in lowercase. Then we follow this with the name of the type that we're extending, that's the content view struct, and we'll follow this with open and close curlies. Down below inside of the curlies, let's define our first variable that's going to hold our title view. We'll do that like this, var title view, lower camel case, because this is a variable, it's not a type, it's not a struct, colon, sum, capital V view, open and close curlies. So this is a computed property. It's not a stored value property that we say is equal to some kind of data. We're going to use curlies in here to compute what goes inside this variable. And what it's going to compute is the view it should show on screen when this variable is named in our code. Then we'll head back up to our text code up top. We'll cut this out and we're going to refer to the variable that we just created. That's title view, lower camel case. No parens after this. This is a variable, not a function. Then let's head back down to the extension and paste this code in between the curlies of that title view variable that we just created. By the way, we could put the word return just before the text view because we're returning this first view, the text view. But since there's always one view at the very top of any computed property that's going to return a view, Swift shorthand allows us to remove the keyword return. You'll almost never see developers include the keyword return in their variable computed properties that compute views. So that's why we don't have it in here. And try this out on the canvas and it works great. Now if we head back up to where we refer to the title view variable inside the vStack, we can option click on the title view and Xcode tells us that this is indeed a variable of type sum view. So when we refer to this variable, it evokes the computed property that we created in the extension. So it draws that text view and all of its modifiers for us. Cool. Now for a challenge. You should be able to create another variable inside the extension and use this to hold everything that's inside of this text view that holds our result message information. Call this new variable result message view. So why don't you pause, give it a shot. It should be easy given what we just did, then resume and let's compare answers. So let's scroll back down into our extension and just underneath the title view computed property, let's create a new one with the keyword var. Ooh, and I almost forgot, since we're not using these variables in any other structs other than content view, it's always a good idea to put the word private in front of the var keyword. This just makes sure that Swift won't allow these variables to be used anywhere outside of the content view. And it'll also restrict code completion so that it doesn't offer these variables up as options. Private means just limit this variable to the current struct. So then to add another computed property to our content view extension, we'll say private var result message view is what we'll call this lower camel case colon sum capital V view open and close curlies. Then we'll head back up to the V stack at the top of our code. We'll highlight the text view that displays the result message and all of its modifiers, cut it out with a command X, enter the name of that computed property we just created, result message view, lower camel case, then scroll back down to our content view and paste in what we just cut out inside the curlies of the result message view. We can try out the buttons in the live preview. Everything is working great. Mission accomplished. Once again, if we scroll back up to the top and option click on the result message view inside of the vStack, we can see it is indeed a variable of type sum view. Now below this, we've got the code for our lazy V grid and our H stack, which lays out our buttons and centers that final row of buttons. This is going to be a little bit more challenging. So what I want to do is hold this off for another lesson. Now in the next lesson, we're going to start by extracting the button layout code from the lazy V grid and the H stack into a separate computed property. But we'll also point out that this is a case where a view makes much more sense and we'll describe why. We'll also notice some quirks using the geometry reader in separate views and we'll learn how to deal with them by working with something called preference keys. And we'll pass values between views using bindings. Now we did have a lot of big learning in this lesson as we extracted a separate view, put that in a separate file, pointed out some issues associated with the preview provider. Then we returned to work with extensions. We created computed properties that return views for more code modularity and better code structure. But there's a lot more big learning to come. Keep at it.